I met a guy named Roy Sales, and he always in our conversations, your name come up a lot as 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 a, as a real great trainer, horseman. Yeah. I, and you know, Roy Seals uh, took care of one horse for me. Uh, after after a little while, his name was uh, Mateo. Remember Mateo? He won the um, the Del Mar or what it was the La Jolla. La Jolla. Yeah, he won the he won the Grade One down there. A anyway, so Roy's job was to take care of that horse because that horse would run his stall a lot. So every every time that horse needed to go out, Roy would take him out and hold him, maybe hold him outside for an hour or something like that, and then put him back in the stall. And he just watched that horse all day. And Roy had a lot of patience because this horse was a high-strung son of a gun, and he needed he needed somebody like Roy who was who was big and strong and he wasn't intimidated, right? And so that horse, they were like buddies, those two. <laughs> oh, they all melted in Roy's hands. Wow. What, what can you tell us about Zenyatta? What do you remember about Zenyatta <laughs> that you that you never told nobody before, uh, exclusive to the real players? <laughs> Well, I think Zenyatta's career is pretty much an open book because she had a, she had a lot of people that came and visited her. And um, I, I would say the big thing people don't realize about Zenyatta is how intense she was on the racetrack because she was always so nice when you took the saddle off and let her out graze. Anybody could walk up to her and pet her and everything. But once she put on her game face, she's a totally different horse. She was a 120% racehorse, right? She was, she was intense. Mario, her groom, is probably six feet tall. He's got shoulders like this, probably weighs 200 pounds. And when he, when he let her go to the pony person uh, to go warm up for the uh, races, he was just ringing wet, ringing wet. And she was so intense before the races that one, one day at Hollywood Park for a vanity, it was, it was really hot that day. And they had a synthetic track, so the heat was radiating off it. She almost washed out really badly warming up for the race. So after that race, we realized that we didn't need to warm her up anymore. So every morning, we'd practice standing her by the quarter pole. So she went out of the paddock, stood by the quarter pole, and waited for the other horses to warm up, and then went to the gate. In all of her races, before the races, I've seen, you know, her theatrics with the, with the post parade and how she danced right, yeah. did a thing. I've never seen a horse right. strut their stuff like that. Can yeah. you tell us a little something? Well, yeah. that's just because she was geared up, right? right? She was intense at that moment. She was like, uh, she was ready to, uh, to run. So in order for her to contain herself, she just couldn't say, oh, okay, walk over there like a nice horse, right? She was shadow boxing. All right, she had, she had to do these things. She had to release it somehow or else she would have exploded. Right. So, so that was, that's how she released it. And then by practicing standing, then she would able, once we stopped, she could stand. What about Giacomo? Can you tell us a little bit about her? Giago? Uh, uh, okay, Giacomo. Giacomo was... A, was the calmest horse in the world, right? Giacomo had a mind on him, just a beautiful mind. He was solid. He uh, he had a lot of talent. And when we um, when we took him to um, Kentucky for the Derby, the exercise rider Frankie Herrera came back to the barn and said, "Oh, he loves this racetrack, you know." And that was a really a great sign for us that you know the horse really liked the surface. So that was good. And then. One of the things that not a lot of people know about Giacomo is so, like I said, he was calm. You could almost lead him over on a loose shank, standing there, standing in the paddock, head down, quiet as can be. It was a warm, early May day. And he just stood and he went like this and turned. And when he turned, he twisted his foot on the brick there and his shoe popped off. So now we're over in the paddock and he's lost his shoe, right? And Giacomo, like a lot of thoroughbreds, have what they call shelly feet. They don't have real strong walls, so that's, so that's a little bit of an issue. So I had, to, I had to tell Frankie, his rider, you have to run back to the barn and, and get, to the, get to the gap before we get off the racetrack because we're going to be heading back to the barn because once you get off the racetrack at Churchill Downs, they have all this little pea gravel. They get a lot of rain, so they have all this little... So with his shelly feet, we had to bandage his foot before he got off the racetrack going back to the barn. <laughs> and you know, who were some of your mentors coming up early on? Oh, wow. That's, um, that's, I've had a lot of people help me along the way. Um, 
I would say my biggest mentor was a man by the name of Henry Freitas. He was the manager of uh, Loma Rica Ranch in Northern California, and um, he was just he was just a great horseman and a, and gave me the chance. He's the only one that gave me a chance. I'm, right, you know, I'm just I'm just out here. Just got out. Just came back from the Vietnam War. I was in New York. Nothing doing in New York. I, I went to California to go surfing. And uh, yeah. <laughs> ended up uh, up someplace, and he gave me a job. So it was just it turned my whole life around. Yeah. And uh, one one thing I always like to mention about Henry, and uh, yeah. sometimes we lose it. Um, one afternoon we're we're breaking the yearlings, and we had another set to go, and it was almost lunchtime. I said, Henry, maybe we should just you know skip one lap and get the other ones out before uh, before lunchtime. Henry said, No, John. We give each horse his equal chance to train. We're not going to short one horse to get another horse out. And I, you know, that really, really stuck with me. And then one of my favorite stories is that I have this yearling, right? And, uh, and I'm trying to put the bridle on him. I'm trying to break him. He's rearing up. He's striking at us, you know. I've got a twitch on his nose. He rears up, knocks a twitch out on my hand. Mm. So I grab him by the ear, I gotta wrestle with him, right? And ah, he rears up. So then I get on his back, he's not even broken. I get on his back, I'm trying to put my hand so he can't rear up, right? And I'm fighting with him for about you know, maybe a half hour or something like that. And I finally say, well, I'm gonna have to go talk to Henry because Henry's always telling me about his 30 years of experience, right? <laughs> so now I'm feeling pretty cocky because I'm pretty good at this, right? <laughs> so I go to Henry and I say, Henry, let me see what your 30 years experience can do with this, to this colt because I cannot put the bridle on him. And Henry, he's about 5'3". He looks at me and he says, John, just go down there, quit all that fooling around, and put the bridle on him. So I, now I'm stunned, right? So I say, okay, I have the most respect for Henry, right? I got utmost respect for him. Say, so okay, I'm going to do exactly what he says. I know he's wrong, but I'm going to do exactly what he says. I'm walking back to the stall and emptying my mind of all this anger and <laughs> I've got with this horse going on, right? So I get to the stall, I walk in the stall, I, do, I, I just take the reins, put it over his neck, put the bridle over his ears, the horse never moved. <laughs> never moved. Wow. So Henry taught me the value of a timeout, right? When mm. you're upset about something, mm. the value is take time, mm. give it a little minute or two, and then things will sort out. Mm. And you know, right throughout the years, what keep you coming back, man? Because you, you, you accomplish so much. What, what keep you coming back? Oh, my love for the horses. Right? There's no doubt about it. How important is the men and women that work on these barns? You know, the men and women that work on these barns, the guys that make it all happen, you know, they, they are the backbone of our industry. Um, without, without their help, we couldn't do anything. Um, these guys are dedicated. I mean, you just don't know how dedicated they are to their horses and how much they love the game and the sport. <coughs> the real players inside the backstretch. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.